This is Kick-Ass News. I'm Ben Mathis. Folks, do you enjoy listening to Kick-Ass News? Well, then become a part of what I'm doing here and help support the show by going to patreon.com slash kickassnews and making a donation. Your encouragement and support is always appreciated. And now, enjoy the podcast. Hi, I'm Ben Mathis, and welcome to Kick-Ass News. These days, you're hearing plenty of Republicans saying that they're leaving the GOP because they simply can't bring themselves to support its nominee, Donald Trump. But one very well-known Republican strategist says they've got it all backwards. It's the party that needs to change, not Donald Trump. And while she changed her registration from Republican to Libertarian the day after Donald Trump won the Indiana primary and effectively clinched the Republican nomination, she insists that her decision had nothing to do with Donald Trump. Mary Madeline is one of the most respected conservative strategists, authors, and pundits in America. She served under three presidents, first under President Ronald Reagan, then most notably as the campaign director for President George H.W. Bush. Since then, she's also served as special assistant to his son, President George W. Bush, and as assistant and counselor to Vice President Dick Cheney. She's been a frequent panelist on NBC's Meet the Press and was host of CNN's Crossfire. And together with her husband, Democrat strategist James Carville, she starred in the HBO dramatic series K Street. She was the host of The Mary Madeline Show on CBS Talk Radio Network, and she now co-hosts the nationally syndicated radio program Both Sides Now, which is broadcast on over a hundred stations. She's co-authored two bestsellers with her husband James Carville. The first was called All's Fair, Love, War, and Running for President, and they followed it up 20 years later with Love and War, 20 years, three presidents, and one Louisiana home. Mary Madeline also wrote the book Letters to My Two Daughters. Today I'll talk with Mary Madeline about her decision to leave the Republican Party after 35 years and change her registration to Libertarian, and why, in spite of that, she says she's still leaning toward supporting Donald Trump for president. Now, in full disclosure, this interview was recorded before the Republican convention, so I'm not sure if Trump's latest controversial statements might have changed her leanings one way or another. But we'll discuss her motives for leaving the GOP, why she says it's been a long time coming, and why she's more inclined to vote for Donald Trump over the libertarian candidate Gary Johnson. Plus, I'll ask how her friend and mentor George Bush Sr. and her husband, Democrat strategist James Carville, took the news of her exit from the GOP. Coming up with Mary Madeline in just a moment. Talking with Mary Madeline, a political strategist who, among other things, served under President Ronald Reagan. Uh, you were also the campaign director for George H.W. Bush's presidential campaign, and you advised his son, President George W. Bush, and Vice President Cheney. Mary, thanks for joining me over the phone. Thank you for having me on, Ben, and congratulations on your success of getting conservatives to be able to express themselves, giving them form. Mary. These Republican credentials are about as strong as they come, and yet you're something of a unique case among the conservatives I'm talking to this week, because back in May, you left the GOP and you registered as a libertarian, but you've said that that had nothing to do with Donald Trump. So what was that about for you? I always considered myself a person of philosophical convictions, not a party loyalist necessarily, except insofar as the party best represented those principles that I believe in when I joined it. I grew up a Democrat on the south side of Chicago and left the Democratic Party when it left me, which was when Ronald Reagan was elected. 
And at the time, the Republican Party really represented what now appear to be only represented by the libertarian philosophy, which is not to say that the current libertarian ticket uh, is one with which I agree. I, I don't agree with uh, Mr. Johnson when he says he agrees with Bernie Sanders 73 percent of the time and on social and even on socialism when it's voluntary. There's no such thing as voluntary socialism in the whole in the whole course of humankind, the only voluntary socialists were the apostles. And I don't think modern socialists in any way represent what Jesus represented <laughs> to the apostles. So so it really wasn't about Donald Trump? It didn't have anything to do with Trump. I think Donald Trump is a product of what caused me to have a temporary hiatus from the party until it, it, it comes back to representing why joint in the first place. And my opinion on the party strain in in ever accelerating ways has been uh, consistent for for some years now. Okay, when was the breaking point for you? After the 2010 and the 2014 midterm elections, when conservative voters gave handed the Republican Party majorities on a silver platter in both. The federal chambers and a majority of the governorships and unified chambers across the country. The governors and the unified chambers proceeded to put in place common sense, outcome based, uh, measurable uh, uh, policies that proved productive while the feds, with the insertion of constitutional Russell Kirk, if you will, Hayek kind of conservatives with Edmund Burke social views and they they did they were stymied at every turn. So even with fresh new blood and the example of the governors, the national Republicans were unable to not only stop Obama, they barely slowed him down and they they in the they may feel that they had been advocating conservative principles, but certainly not loudly and full throatedly, if you will. And I really got I think this the breaking point for me was when they started calling candidates and who were elected as Republicans, like uh, Ted Cruz, wacko birds and such. I took that personally. I'm not a wacko bird, and I've worked for 30 years, hard, for nothing in the party. And, and when when I did politics, you didn't get paid very much. In the <laughs> last 10 years of my life, I've done it all for free. So I, as did, of course, all of the activists who got those huge tsunami majorities. Well, what does Donald Trump bring to the GOP that you felt was lacking before? At the outset, I welcomed Trump into the race. I thought he would provide the kind of testicular fortitude and guidance <laughs> and, and an example for the party, which yeah. to be able to give okay. an understanding of the frustration and the anxiety and the anger of not just conservative Americans, but all Americans. And also, importantly in politics, what Donald Trump did and continues to do is resist the, the absolutism of some elite, some beltway or mainstream media, whatever you want to call them, some cultural elite, the ruling party uh, definition of what are the most critical issues. Guess what? I don't get up in the morning, Ben, and have a big fight about transgender bathrooms. <laughs> and I don't get up in the morning and fight about guns. And I don't yeah. think – and he just calls it like it is. Do you have any hesitations about Donald Trump? I, I did not like the, some of the ways in which he attacked conservatives that I have a lot of respect for. Yeah. And I didn't like that he couldn't couldn't express sort of a broadly conservative, common sense, philosophical framework. I think his selection of Pence and his um, release of his list of his Supreme Court uh, potential nominees, have gone a long way to assuaging the concerns of people like me. Okay. His response to the uh, 
tragedies in Orlando and uh, recently France and of course now Turkey have validated my my uh, preference for his foreign policy and national security uh, thrust. So I I like Donald Trump. I mean I'm not I he would he wasn't my first choice, but he certainly is a solid choice. And okay. I'm I, by the time we go to air, it's it's evident that the never Trumps are are never going to succeed, <laughs> and it's also evident that he whatever Hillary throws at him, and she's outspent him forty to one, he's still standing. And so mm. I'm I'm pretty I'm very positive about this fall's outcome. Okay, you had said that you're not just going to vote for Trump to stop Hillary. You said you needed some conservative reassurances first. So are you saying then that you have heard what you needed to hear from Donald Trump at this point? I've heard about 50 percent of it, but I, you know, he, I think with Pence now on the ticket, there'll be the, the, the kind of articulation of what I believe in, in language that is more familiar to my ears. What I, what I always liked about Trump was He's an outcome-based guy. If it works, let's mm. do it. If it doesn't work, let's stop it. And I'm never, ever going to vote for Hillary, and I would never not vote. And yes, I'm get, I'm feeling better all the time. So then do you feel that the never-Trumpers and some of the Republicans in Congress who've been hesitant about supporting Donald Trump have been disloyal by not falling in line and supporting the nominee? Um, there's always been a faction that demanded, uh, not absolute concessions, but some sort of, uh, adherence to the principles that, that activate them to be, or motivate them to be active. So I don't know what was the big deal when the never Trump people were saying, or the, the, concerned people like Paul Ryan initially was. I don't know why that was such a stretch or not even remotely unusual for people of longstanding conservative work and advocacy and belief to say, look, we want to hear more. And he, he, uh, he looks like he's hearing that by the aforementioned acts that he's committed so far. Does it make you feel uncomfortable when he talks about walking back some of his more conservative positions as we move into the general election now? If there was a time there where he was saying things that I agreed with policy-wise, and then he'd say, but they're only suggestions. <laughs> and in a way, you can't, if there's anybody else saying that you could understand that in the Reagan-esque yeah. way that, look, I'm gonna, this is what I'm going to work for, but yeah. I can only get done what I can get done. But he didn't say it like that. He said it in a way that the, uh, allowed one to infer they were not his rock-solid principles. Right. They were just whatever the last person he talked to told him. Having said all that, I also recognize this. If you've done this for your entire adult life, as I have, you have an ear attuned to it to a language that is clearly not one that Trump is familiar with, which doesn't mean he doesn't believe it. It just means he doesn't sing in the same uh, tune or the, the same melody that conservatives do. And it also, but he does talk like the overwhelming percentage numbers, masses of Americans. He talks like they talk. We're going to take a quick break right now, and then I'll be back for more with Mary Madeline, back in just a moment. Hey folks, do you like reading but find it's getting harder and harder to make time to curl up with a good book? Well, there's a solution. Give audiobooks a try. They're perfect for your commute to work or working out at the gym, a relaxing bath, or any time, really. And right now, you can take an audiobook for a spin with a special promotion just for our listeners from audible.com. Just go to audibletrial.com slash kickassnews to get a free 30-day trial and download any of Audible's 180,000 titles entirely for free. That's audibletrial.com 
slash kickassnews, or click on the sponsor link on our webpage to download the free audiobook of your choice. And now, back to the show. You've said that this may be the end of the two-party system, and you've said various things indicating that this may be uh, the moment that the Republican Party jumped the shark, not because of Donald Trump, but because it's been a long time coming. Can I can I butt in right there? Of course, I was misquoted. Oh, you were? Or okay. Misconstrued or mischaracterized. I okay. didn't say it was the end of the two-party system. I said because there'll never be an end of the two-party system because there'll never be an end of two distinct philosophical thrusts in a representative republic or a democracy. Right. And that goes back to Cicero and Aristotle. And I mean, that's as old as humans governing themselves. What I did say is that it is would not be the first time in history that either party made a transition to better represent one of the two of those philosophical thrusts. Okay. So when the, okay. Whigs, when the Whigs stopped representing uh, sort of the Jeffersonian, Madison, Madisonian state sovereignty model uh, with enumerated powers for the federal government, then they cease to be. Yeah. I'm not saying the Republican Party is going to cease to be or the two-party system is going to cease to be. I'm saying the current Republican Party, as it exists, if it refuses to be uh, give a full-throated, full-spectrum explanation for what that philosophy is and why it works and, and how it has worked and what it and, and, and why it will work in the future, then then those people who, who are walking the walk are going to walk somewhere else. And the same with the Democratic yeah. Party. It, I'm so, I have as many Democratic friends who do not get Bernie Sanders, do not get Hillary Clinton, and they're unprepared to be Republican, but they're they just that's not the Democratic Party that they feel represents either their policy preferences or their cultural values. So this is not unusual. Both parties have have gone through these transitions. And that's what I said is at the end of both parties, as we know them, is on the horizon. But the, the persistence okay. of a two party system, when that goes away, then this country goes away. Okay. And right now we have one party in Washington. It's the Washington Party. It's a big government party and a little less big, but still big government party. Well, does that mean then that either Trump is the savior of the GOP and the the response to the problem, or is he perhaps maybe the four horsemen of the apocalypse signaling the end of the party? No, I think Trump is, he's neither. I think he's a product and a result of a detached party. At least the, the the what we hear the party represents, and by definition, what they failed to do or versus Obama, I think he's a result of that, and I think he's a transition to the bridging libertarians, social conservatives, fiscal conservatives, and I I think he is well suited to, to do that. I mean, his curse is his strength, if you know what I mean. Like nobody, you can't pin him down as any kind of conservative, but you yeah. can pin him down for, if, you, if you use business life as an example, yeah. as an outcome-based guy. It's not working. He drops it like a hot potato. If it is working, he, he greatly succeeds at it. Yeah. So I think he's transitional, but the being a, a candidate and, and being an elected official, an office holder, is – being in the having the public's trust is a highly skilled endeavor and it requires a lot of sacrifice so i think that people a lot of people who have the kind of skills that donald trump has would use them tend to use them in the private sector not the public sector so i don't know that he'll be i i think he'll be a good transitional figure to we till we get back to the next Jack Kemp or Ronald Reagan or, you know, somebody like that. Uh, now that you're a libertarian, I have to ask, you don't have major problems with his abuse of eminent domain, his embracing torture, saying he wants to open up the libel laws to stop the media from criticizing him, shutting down houses of worship, birthright citizenship and all those things. The, those well, don't trouble don't you as, as a new libertarian? Again, 
I'm going to say that if, if I cannot, I'm not confident that every conservative thing he says is ironclad. I am mm. confident that wacky things he says are, he won't do. Okay. It's one thing to be a, a, an advocate of eminent domain when you're in the private sector right. and you're Right, that's and fair. The, your desires for self-interest. It's another when your desire and your actions have to be for the public good. He's not going to. You can't. You can't buy. Well, I'm a constitutionalist, so of course I'm. I don't. Care if Jefferson said it's like for the free press or free country. I'll take a, a free press. What about his statements about immigrants, calling them rapists and murderers, calling for a ban on Muslim immigration? Does any of that concern you? Not only am I not concerned, I support being able or having the confidence that we have the ability to vet people who are coming to this country that may, might want to do us harm or, in the alternative, cannot be contributing members of society. I'm very pro immigration, but the immigration that is that is leads to assimilation of, by people that want to live in this country. It's certainly not people that are getting under coming to America under false pretenses. And I, it, I having worked in the 9-11 White House, post 9-11 White House, I understand the efficiency of these asymmetrical Islamic terrorists, this asymmetrical warfare. If we harden one target, they find a soft spot. And the soft spot right now is our very poorest borders and our unenforced immigration law. So I don't necessarily like his expression of it when it sounds like it's discriminatory, but I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's saying it as a as a security measure, not a some sort of discriminatory opinion. Okay. And you're never Hillary. Uh, between Gary Johnson, your libertarian candidate, and Trump, do you know which way you might be leaning around now? Oh yeah, I'm gonna vote for Trump. I mean, okay. I'm not. Yeah, I I like and respect both Governor Johnson and Governor Weld. But as I said, that ticket would be in agreement with Bernie Sanders 73 percent of the time. Then they're gonna be. <laughs> I'm gonna be opposed to them 73 percent of the time. The candidate that I liked, who lost by a couple of votes, was Austin Peterson. To 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 my mind, represented Milton Friedman, free market. Edmund Burke, uh, cultural Edmund Burke, practical Jeffersonian, Madisonian, and Hamiltonian, if you will, conservative. Okay, so traditional small government conservatism. I'm not anti-government. There needs mm -hmm. to be a central uh, government for economy of scale, for commerce, for trade, for national security, for any number of things, but not one that is that is currently denying, is violating the rights of the majority for the minority that is in power. Well, before we go, you were the strategist, as I mentioned earlier, to President Bush 41, and you've remained close with the family. In fact, you're one of the very few non-family members who, who who's allowed to call him Poppy Bush. Um, how did he take the news when you said you were leaving the Republican Party? I, you know, I've, I've never, I've always been, I think, an oddball, which didn't bother me. <laughs> I wasn't a movement conservative, and I wasn't a connected Republican. I was just a girl from the Midwest who came to Washington with Ronald Reagan, who grew up in the steel mills. My mother was a beautician, ran beauty school, small business owner, and I've just always kind of marched to the beat of my own drum. So okay. I don't think, and, you know, believe me, I've done far worse as far as party okay. regulars are concerned, starting with marrying James Carville, which <laughs> they'll never get over, except the Bushes and the Cheneys and people of goodwill um, appreciate my affection for him and appreciate that he loves me. So it's not like I haven't expressed my opinion about my philosophy in the past. And because it was so misconstrued as a, blanket repudiation of the party as opposed to a, an embrace of, uh, and a reassertion of principles right. that I thought were the foundation of the Republican Party. I think people who know me 
uh, know what was going on there. And I, you know, Cheney came right out of the box for Trump and the Bushes came right out of the box against Trump. So <laughs> everybody's kind of all over the board in this. Cycle. Yeah. So so the GOP may not have lost you forever. You think you might come back one day or they may come back to you. Well, let's put it that way. I'm let me say this. I'm continue to support and am continuing to work hard and raise money for and contribute to in every sense of the word Republicans that are that advocate what I believe in. Colonel Manis is running for Senate in Louisiana. Uh, Garrett Graves. We have a number of Louisiana is sort of a hotbed of good conservatives and there are good conservatives running across the country and, and a lot of the governors and a number of people who are running for statewide offices at the federal level. So I'm going to continue supporting them. But I guess it's kind of hard to explain this when <laughs> when people are running on the principles in which I believe if their label was I'm a purple people leader from Mars, <laughs> but I believe in Edmund Burke and Jefferson and Madison and Hamilton. And I'm like, okay, I'm with you. All righty. Well, I appreciate your talking to me before we wrap up here. I just have to ask when you changed your party registration, did your husband do a little happy dance or throw you a party when you changed to libertarian? It was good. It really was no big deal. We were, I mean, I didn't mean it to be a big statement. I'll tell you how this happened, Ben. I was on Mark Halpern's and John Hellman's show with uh, uh, a spokesman for Paul Ryan who was trying to explain why Paul Ryan was reluctant to support Trump. And he, his initial uh, reason was, he said, because Cruz got out of the race too early and it surprised us. Well, to me, that's what Americans hate about politicians. Yeah. It's a, that's a process answer. So I said, I came in and I butted in, as I'm wont to do. And I said, no, what Paul Ryan is doing, and I know Paul Ryan, I like Paul Ryan, I think he's doing a good job. I don't agree with to my conservative friends, Republican friends who trash Paul Ryan. I said, what Paul Ryan is trying to do is, it, is speak to people like me who believe in a set of principles, and that's what they want to vote on, and that's what will make them con con continue to be active in the Republican Party. And, it, and if that's not happening or Trump can't appeal to those people, then it, if they're really serious about politics, they'll change their registration to libertarian like I did. It was a total aside comment, which became the story, but I was trying to, I was trying to defend uh, Paul O'Brien, whom, as I said, I, I really do respect. So I uh, know James okay. understands that, and he didn't. He doesn't. He never does a happy dance over anything <laughs> I do in politics because whatever I do, it's going to be against whatever he is for. Because <laughs> okay. those, those two trains have left the station, and never the the train shall meet. Well, Mary, I appreciate your calling in to talk to me, and uh, do tell your hubby, we've been trying to get him to come on the show for a while, if he can be happily married to a conservative for all these years, I'm sure that he could stand a few minutes with little old me. Mary Madeline, it's been a pleasure, and thank you so much for coming on the show. All right, Ben, thanks for everything you're doing. Appreciate it. Thanks again to Mary Madeline for coming on the show, and if you enjoyed today's episode... She's written several books worth reading, including the most recent one, which she co-wrote with her husband, James Carville. It's called Love and War, 20 Years, Three Presidents, Two Daughters, and One Louisiana Home. I'll include an Amazon link where you can order it in the show notes for this episode and on our website at kickassnewspodcast.com. Or if you'd prefer to listen to the audio version, you can download that for free through that special trial offer just for our listeners at audibletrial.com slash kickassnews. You can also listen to her nationally syndicated radio program called Both Sides Now. Find station listings and information at bothsidesradio.com. Mary Madeline does not have a Twitter account, but you can keep up with the latest on her at marymadeline.info. Be sure to subscribe to Kick-Ass News on iTunes and leave us a review while you're there. You can visit Kick-Ass News on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at at KA Politics. And please be sure to recommend Kick-Ass News to your friends on your social media. And if you really want to help out, then donate to our GoFundMe campaign at GoFundMe.com 
slash kickassnews or make a recurring donation at patreon.com slash kickassnews. And as always, I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at kickassnewspodcast.com. For now, though, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kickass News. Kick-Ass News is a trademark of Mathis Entertainment, Inc.